Hello and welcome to another edition of Mailbag. What is Mailbag? Well, Mailbag is a feature of the channel where you guys leave lots of comments on the channel and I attempt to answer those comments or if I can't answer those comments, I throw it out to you guys who have more knowledge on some of this stuff than I do. So, let's get into the first mailbag of this session. Remember, like, comment, subscribe to the channel. Go over to Instagram and follow me there. Go over to Facebook, follow me there. That's where the normal notices are. And consider becoming a Patreon. It's quite funny, normally at this time on a Sunday, I would probably either be playing keyboards or uh, recording the rent. Um, but the rent's been a bit dry for the last couple of weeks. I've been kind of struggling. I've just kicked my clapperboard over. Uh, so um, I thought I'd do some mailbag this morning because uh, I've got a lot to catch up on. Um, this next one comes from Stephen Thomas and it's in response to the Tom Oberheim can use his name again SMR I did uh, back in August 2021. And uh, Stephen writes, yeah, I agree. There have been rumblings about Tom and Dave uh, releasing an OBX later this year on the heels of the Profit 5 uh, Rev 4. Tom also did a very short run of the TVS with the Oberheim name uh, and the OBIE glyph which hasn't been used in decades. It's absolutely right for him to get his name and logo back for branding. Bob Moog had similar trouble and finally won the one in court. Um, and it's really interesting um, this whole kind of use, use your name and, and, and lose the right to use your name. Um, there was definitely a reason why Beringer had done the deal um, because a few months back the, the two sides to be squaring up for a quite a lengthy court battle. Um, I would say that Beringer Music Tribes had legally acquired uh, the right to use the Oberheim name in territories that weren't the US. Um, and the, uh, you know, acquiring a trademark is not an easy thing to do, so being able to acquire a trademark is quite a an expensive and hard slog um, and also you know then having to fight for that trade main through uh, the courts in foreign territories is not a cheap experience. Um, Bob Moog had to do, I say Moog, Bob Mogg had to do the same uh, to recover his rights to trade mark. So I guess um, it's kind of probably watch this space to find out what did um, Tom Oberheim trade away to get his name back, what has he had to agree to? And I suspect it's something to do with the OBI, OBXA is a, as just a guess. That's um, probably what was what was the bargaining chip that was being uh, being used. Um, because as I say, it, it's an expensive process getting trademarks registered and fighting trademarks. So uh, you know you don't give them away for nothing. This next one comes from somebody with a oriental name, and I'm hoping that the oriental characters um, ingressize as Kisko, Kishu, Kishu, Kishu. Um, and apologies if they don't, because um, uh, I can't read um, uh, sort of Japanese style characters. So, um, in response to. Uh, Da, da, da. Setting up the MIDI and the switches on the Chordbot video. I, video I did, oh, oh, that's got to be quite a few years ago, let's say 2019. I haven't got it written down on the sheet. I had a sequence of these recently where I haven't actually written this down on the sheet. Hey ho! Um, and uh, Kishu writes, how can it be sequenced externally? Um, this being the Chordbot. And the short answer is, um, it's not really designed to be sequenced externally. I'm not saying it can't be. Um, so there are a number of firmware um, rewrites going on um, with Isla Instruments, but Isla is a very small company and they've been concentrating their efforts on the S2400, which is kind of their flagship piece. Uh, and the, the cord bot has kind of gone a bit by the wayside. Um, plus the fact that <laughs> Brad has had numerous problems with coders, um, joining his organization and leaving his organization uh, read into that what you will 
Um, but there was, there have been new firmware drops for the Cordbot recently. Uh, I don't think any of them are an externally sequenced um, piece, but they are actually working towards a sequencer on the Cordbot, some sort of step sequencer. However, if you do fire a C into the chord bot and you have the chord bot set to major chords, you will get a C major chord. In fact, you'll get a C major chord based on how deep that chord is. So, for argument's sake, if you, um, if you had the range set to six note polyphony when you hit a C, you will effectively get six notes of a C major chord, which is effectively two Cs, two Es, two, a, um, two Es, two Gs. Um, and it'll be either up the keyboard that way or down the keyboard that way, depending on how you set the chord bot up. So effectively, you can actually get it to play uh, chords, much the same as you could on, say, uh, one of the workstations where you can program the pads to um, play uh, extended chord sequences, etc. When you when you hit the pads, chord bot works pretty much the same way as that, which is quite good. Um, so you know by setting your chord type in the in the chord selector, so you know majors, minors, sevenths, extended, suspended, whatever it happens to be. I mean, there's a myriad of of different types of chord on the chord bot. Um, you can get the you can externally trigger those from a sequencer by just pumping the the root note in through uh, MIDI. Um, now, can you fire CC commands into the chord bot to change the chord type prior to the note information? Um, I have never tried that. I have to be honest and say I've never tried it. Um, but then I kind of turn around and say, if you're going to do that, why don't you just get your sequencer to fire the notes anyway? And if, if that's the case, um, it seems to be a lot of work for very little gain. So I'm not sure why you would, would want to do it anyway. I mean, the chord bot is, is designed really as a composition tool. Um, I think that's, that's kind of fair to say that's what Brad designed it as, is you when you're sitting writing compositions and trying to work out chord progressions and that sort of stuff, um, that's what the chord bot really, well, that's kind of how I've, I, I use the chord bot anyway, is for these chord progressions, so you know, I want to go from this to that to that to that, but I don't want it just to be sort of, um, you know, bulk standard this that that. So I want to change that. I want to have run, you know, play eight notes a go rather than playing three notes a go or six notes a go, which is probably probably my my um, limit, <laughs> if you like. So you can extend with the chord bot. You can extend how that works. Um, but again, I say, you know, the chord bot really is is more of a uh, well, I use it more as a development tool rather than a, than a, um, a sequencer at the moment because it doesn't have a sequencing on my particular core bot. Um, but you know, I think the thing about the core bot as well is that you know people don't well, they probably should now because it's been out a few years and there's lots of videos on the internet about what the core bot is. But the core bot is effectively is a as far as I'm concerned is a is a surface is a controller. Um, and you need something else to generate the sound. Now, whether you're generating the sounds through um, a big workstation or a little little um, sound module, it's irrelevant, but that's what the call bot will do. So you set the call bot up, tell it what channel you want it to transmit on, and boom, it'll fire out um, whatever chords you are hitting on the actual machine itself. Um, I hopefully, that's answered your question in a very roundabout way, but that's kind of what the call bot is about. Thank you.